um, you know, account for seeing pools. You know, because that would that would take us all day. That's a seven-hour course in and of itself. But uh, and, and the different ways that you can do it. So right now we just take the numbers pretty much as a given. And these um, the first three years um, that are listed here. Uh, the reason they go from 2000 is that it's an actual company. It's for uh, CBS, actually. So these numbers are millions, you know. And so, uh, so if you were to look on their, you know, on their um, financial statements for the year 2000, you would find, you know, they did, um, you know, just over 20 billion dollars in revenue, right? So all those numbers are given, and then. The projections were made just making, you know, certain basic assumptions, um, you know, about the growth in sales and, you know, and things like that. And um, so, um, at this point, we can even actually look back and see how accurate these projections were, because we, we can look at the 2003 states, we can look at 2004, 2005, but the purpose of this is just to get a, a working feel for, you know, for how a model will work. Um, or how, you know, one version of an LBO model works. Um, so again, three, the major three statements are, um, are hard-coded. The DCF, um, you know, is here just to sort of give you a feel for, um, for this valuation method that we, that we discussed. Uh, we're not going to spend as much time on it, uh, just because a lot of this stuff can be done without a DCF. You just need, you know, you just need to have a feel for what the cash flows are going to be. Um, but, uh, you know, not necessarily the discounting. But because we need to discuss it, uh, and this is an important aspect of evaluation, um, you know, I thought it was, you know, relevant to include the model. That's drawn off those same financial statements. So the DCF is drawn off the financial statements. And a lot of the basic information for the LBO model is drawn off the DCF. So let's just quickly start with uh, just going through some of the elements. The income statement. Now this is just set up, you know, like a standard public company income statement would be. And again, <clears throat> you know, when you guys are building models, that's going to be the idea is to be as standardized as possible. You know, so, because, like I said, a lot of times when you are in a situation where you're modeling at all, you're dealing with a situation where somebody brought you in to do something that they either don't like to do or are capable of doing. So let's say, well, we need somebody who can, uh, you know, who's good at financial models, so, you know, they can, uh, who's good with Excel, so they can put valuations on a company. So what they're going to tell you is the value of the company. They're not going to give a lot of guidance, you know. Mm -hmm. So you're just going to be that on one extreme, or the other extreme is that you'll be working somewhere with templates, right? So the reality is that, you know, if 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 you go to work for buyout, you know, for one of Lehman Brothers buyout funds, they're going to have models already, right? They're not going to expect you to build one from scratch. They're going to expect you to have the capability and the understanding of a model, you know, uh, where you could if you had to, but nobody really would ever in practice. You know, I mean, there's just going to be a thousand templates that are floating out there that are specific to the specific, specific industries that you guys are working with, you know. Because, um, again, every model is not going to fit for every company. Um, and um, so, again, you know, the thing now is just to be able to understand the thinking behind the different elements of the model, you know. So, again, uh, just going through starting going through the income statement. You know, again, this is set up, if you were looking at, um, you know, with the exception, you know, down to the EBITDA point, this is exactly what you would see in, um, you know, these guys' public file. So, you know, again, net sales, so that's the same as revenue, uh, COGS, uh, which every company doesn't have calls, you know. That's just, you know, some, some companies that are services companies don't have calls, you know, but for most companies, you're going to see calls line, gross margin, 
uh, which is just simply, uh, you know, just going to simply be uh, sales, you know, uh, minus cost. Uh, uh, general administrative expenses, sales, general administrative, so anything, you know, paying a sales force, you know, keeping the lights on, you know, paying for phones, these kinds of things. Uh, again, depreciation and amortization, we talked about that. You know, every time you write down an existing asset that has to go somewhere, so that's going to be in that line. Um, you know, then you have to look the operating expenses here. Uh, and then get operating profit. Uh, and again, even. You know, so, and, and, you know, that operating profit, like even the name of it, gives you a feel for how that fundamental measure, the operations of the business, you know, so that's before all these other sort of non-standard things, you know. And so, so yeah, so that's going to give you your earnings before interest, tax, and appreciation. So the fundamentals of the business, you sold something, you spent a, a, a certain amount of time for raw materials or whatever you spent to get in it, you spent a certain amount of money selling it, you know. And so for a lot of companies, this number is negative. So that means that the fundamentals of business, regardless of what they're doing financially, the fundamentals of the business are off or, or haven't become profitable yet if it's an early stage company. So in any case, um, coming below that line, we subtract off things like the interest expense uh, and we deal with any unusual items. So again, these are important from the standpoint of that, that they're not fundamental to the business. So let's say if a company sells, sells a whole division off, right? They can have a huge positive number under unusual items, um, you know, say an SG&A or whatever, right? But that's not reflective of their business doing well that year. You know, they sold something. You know, that's a financial or, you know, sort of accounting move. That's not an operational move. So, that, so that's why you can see if we just add that depreciation back and go with EBITDA. You know, because because companies can do weird things to affect, um, you know, to affect those other areas. They can do weird things to affect their taxes. You know, they can do weird things to affect the amount of interest they pay. They can do weird things to create unusual, you know, sources of uh, of income that really have nothing to do with the fundamentals of the business. And so that's why we, you know, we really look at closely at operating profit. You know, and then we just add back appreciation because it's a non cash expense. Um, so again, you know, taxes, if the company's paying taxes, and then they give some net earnings. So net earnings is what you see in a PE ratio online, you know, if you're looking at Yahoo company. Um, you know, so so after this, um, you know, we're looking at preference dividends, which is just, you know, just preferred stock in a company. Um, you know, that's, that's really um, you know, and then net earnings after that, um, you know, is divided up between every shareholder. Um, and that can potentially go to shareholders in the form of a dividend or it can be recycled back into the company. Uh, so just want to go through that real quick. Uh, I mean, these are just per share numbers. That Diluted EPS takes into account all of the shares um, that are potentially outstanding. So, the thing is that there's options and things that may be in the money but haven't been exercised, right? So if there are options that are in the money, then that gets included in the diluted earnings per share. So you not only count the common shares that are out there, but you account you also account for the potential shares that could enter, you know, into the market if all of the current options that are exercisable were exercised. Um, uh, question. Yes. Why do you uh, include the goodwill adjustment for the EPS? On the EPS? Yeah. Uh, you mean here? Yeah. Or the You mean why do we add it back? Yeah, why would you add it back? I understand that it's, it's a non cash expense. But. Yeah, well, well, in this case, it's just. Um, because the type of company was just an important measure. So you wouldn't see... Um, I mean, because they acquired television licenses and... Right, yeah, yeah, exactly. Goodwill above, you know, right, 